Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, he writes at the intersection of comfort and claustrophobia, of the past and the present, of big dreams and small failures. I talk with Pulitzer Prize winning author Richard Russo next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Have you ever looked out of a plane onto the vast swath of land that is rural America and wondered, who lives down there and what are they doing right now? Well, those burgs and hamlets come alive in the novels of Richard Russo. Russo, the author of 10 books, is known for animating the interior life of small town America, from the easy familiarity and security it provides to the eccentricities and cruelties it can spawn. His novels include Straight Man, Bridge of Sighs, and Nobody's Fool, which was made into a movie starring Paul Newman. Mr. Russo is probably best known for his Pulitzer Prize winning novel Empire Falls, which he adapted into an Emmy-nominated miniseries on HBO. The program also starred Paul Newman, along with Ed Harris and a cast of other luminaries. His latest work is called Elsewhere, a memoir. It's the story of his life on the road, both literally and figuratively, with his mother. Mr. Russo's in Boise is the keynote speaker for the Idaho Humanities Council's Distinguished Humanities Lecture, and I'm pleased that he and that organization have found some time in his schedule to stop by the studio for this conversation. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Have you ever been in Idaho before? This is my first time. Well, there are lots of small towns here that you could uh, delve into for material for your stories. You think? <laughs> yeah. Stay a while. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, before we talk about your memoir, you know, this small town life, as I mentioned in the introduction, has been not only the backdrop, but really almost a character yeah. in, in, in almost all of your mm -hmm. books. Do, do you think that you could write a novel set in a big city? Oh, I think I'll leave that to Tom Wolfe and Richard Price. <laughs> they seem to be doing such a good job <laughs> of it. Um, what, what attracts me to small towns uh, really is, is my interest in class. And um, the great thing about small towns, uh, a town like Empire Falls, is that uh, at one end of the economic scale, you have Mrs. Whiting, who, who pretty much runs the town, the town, owns the town. And... Um, at the other end, you have um, uh, young John Voss, um, who clothes himself out of the dumpsters behind stores uh, along Main Street. And in a small town, um, unlike so many of America's, you know, gated communities or large cities that have, you know, such, such uh, distinct neighborhoods where people do the same kind of work for the same kind of money and, and, and there's a kind of homogeneity that... that, that arises. Uh, in a small town, um, Mrs. Whiting and John Voss cross paths and, and um, sometimes in such ways that they leave lasting uh, marks on each other. And so small towns are, to me, the, the most appropriate crucible for looking, for looking at um, the issue of, of class in America and how it relates to destiny. And you're able to plumb the depths of your own life as well because you grew up in a small town, Gloversville. New York. I, I, I am a small town boy to the marrow of my bones. And live in a small town now. I live in a small town now most most of the time. Um, my wife and I now that now that our, our daughters are, are both are both grown um, and and married and, and and having lives and families um, of their own, um, we we took this enormous we took this enormous leap three or four years ago by buying an apartment in Boston. <laughs> so we do, we, we're, we're, testing, we're testing the big city waters. A couple of months a year, we go, we go down there and, um, um, and, and live a little bit different kind of life than either of us is used to. Well, your memoir, Elsewhere, yeah. um, is set in the beginning, certainly, uh, in the small town in which you and your mother, mm -hmm. single mother, grew up in Gloversville, New York, named so because gloves used to be made there. And um, even when you're not in that small town with her, she and you move away, it's omnipresent. Yeah, it really it's, is, it's, isn't it's it? It's omnipresent. I wanted to ask you, first of all, why you wanted to write this memoir 
a little bit of a diversion from, from what you have been doing? Well, um, my mom died about four years ago. And um, it, it became apparent to me fairly quickly that I wanted, that I wanted to write this book and needed to write it. Um, her, her death hit me hard. And, um, and I found myself um, uh, thinking about her and thinking about her life a lot after she died during my waking hours. Um, and um, she was invading my sleep as well uh, in, in my dreams, which seemed to suggest to me that, that we, we had some, or I had some sort of unfinished business uh, to take care of. So, um, and I approached the, um, the memoir in, in much the same way I approach fiction, in a sense. This was not written so that I could tell either my story or my mother's story. Um, it was written in the hopes of getting some answers. Um, and um, I've never been the kind of writer who wants to tell people what I know. I'm just really trying to figure out what I know and how I know it and when I knew it. And I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, like, I'm like I'm taking rubber hoses to myself in an interrogation. What did you know and when did you know it? Uh, sort of sort of thing. So I knew I, I, I knew I needed um, to write this book because there were there were things when people ask me things about my own life and about my mother's life and about Gloversville and over the years I found that I had developed some kind of glib answers but whenever anybody asked me further questions I would find that that sometimes the answers that I was giving them didn't really even make sense to me. And so um, shortly after my mother's death, when I was thinking about these things in the front of my brain rather than the back of my brain, it just, it just seemed to me that I might find the answers to some of the questions that I was posing myself. Questions, if I treated... Questions about why she was the way she was, some of the paradoxes that she lived with. I mean, going back again to the theme of the small town. And her genetic gifts to me as well, right. because we, we, have, we have an awful lot in common. Right. We had an awful lot in common, my mother and I. I mean, you... you, you you knew that she had what we would call uh, manic depression or bipolar disorder, yeah. but you came to understand that she also had obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah. OCD. And you write in She was never diagnosed by right. a professional. And I'm, right. I'm <laughs> but but yeah. many of the things that you as a small yeah. child had to help her with, attend to, I mean, you were essentially in some ways a, you know, a caretaker from a very young age of your mom uh, because of some of the her demons, we might say. Yeah. But you write in the book, as you say, that um, you have found that you had many similar traits to your mother, including some obsessions. And you write, my next obsession might well have been a woman an, or a narcotic or a bottle of tequila. Instead, I stumbled onto storytelling and I became infected. So in a sense, you channeled some of the same tendencies your mom might have had into a positive direction. Uh, but you shared similarities. That that makes it sound a little bit smarter than it actually was mm. at the time. Mm. It makes it sound like I was searching for some right. for some way to do that to turn a negative into a positive, and 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 it wasn't, it wasn't quite, quite that rational. Reflecting back on it. That's yeah, what see. yeah. That's what I that's right. what I see now. Reflecting reflecting back on it, and uh, but, but, gosh, how to say this. Um, in the memoir, I, I write I, I write about this time when I was in when I was in uh, college, and I became addicted to a particular pinball machine, and and that had for me a particular sensation. I could almost feel the thrumming of my of my blood when I was standing at that machine, and when I wasn't standing at it, I was thinking about it. I was I was hearing I was hearing the bells. It was a very visceral physical um, physical feeling that I had. And uh, I had a devil of a time just kicking that. Who can't quit playing pinball? Come on. Uh, but I did. I had a devil of a time uh, stopping that. But when I found writing and when I started to write and started compulsively writing stories, it was the same feeling. Which is to say that one thing which was incredibly stupid and destructive gave me the same feeling as the thing that has so changed my life for the better, which is becoming a writer, become, um, 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 a, a writer of stories. And in the beginning, I mean, I was bad. <laughs> so, so, I mean, even, even, even at the beginning when I was writing so compulsively and, and, and getting this, this kind of same high that I would get from, from playing pinball down in the dungeons of the, of the University of Arizona Student Union. The feeling, the feeling was, was, I, was identical 
And it wasn't like I looked at what I was doing and saying, oh, this is great. It sucked, but, but it was the same That's feeling. The same. I, couldn't, I couldn't stop doing it. The buzz was the same. And it was your, mo your mother who introduced you to reading and then yeah. uh, on to, to writing. You say that it's from my mother that I learned reading was not a duty but a reward. Yeah. You can't make a writer without first making a reader, and that's what my mother made me. Yeah. So she was a, a lonely woman, often depressed, but books were her solace, yeah. and, she, and she gave that gift to you as well. Without ever saying so, um, when at the end of one of her incredibly long days that would run to 11 and 12 hours you know, from, from start to finish, when another per person would have collapsed in front of the television and kind of vegged out, um, her opening up a book um, was um, a way to cheat in a way. It was a way to, it was a way to cheat her own existence. And, and without ever saying so, um, I, I understood at some level as a kid that, that readers, and then even more perhaps than readers, writers, uh, have that chance to cheat. You know, most of us are trapped in, in, a, in a body and in a, and in a life. And um, those of us who read voraciously know that, that we get more. We get more out of it than, than, than other people do. We can live as many lives as we can imagine. And a writer has that, that sense with, I think, even greater intensity sometimes. Now, this is a frank assessment of your mother and mm -hmm. of your relationship with yeah. her, your frustrations with her sometimes as she was going through her, her mood swings. Could you have written this book when she was alive? No. Something you had to do after she passed? No. No, I couldn't have done this with a live. It was, it w it would have given it would have given her pain, um, and so no, no. Um, um, it would have it would have given it would have given her pain, and that's that's one thing. But I also couldn't have written it while she was alive, because I didn't know enough. I it it was it was her it was her it was her death that allowed me to put things in perspective, and ask the kind of questions about a person's, the scope and, and, and shape of a person's life, until that life ends, you don't really begin to think of it as a, as a whole and begin to, and you don't ask yourself, <laughs> and, yeah, and you don't ask yourself the same questions that you ask when you're in the middle of something. It's, it's, only, when, it's only when that something assumes a final shape that, that you begin to ask those, those kinds of questions. So I couldn't have written it because I wouldn't have heard her. Um, I wouldn't have heard her for the world. Um, but also because at, at that point I was, I, was still, I was still in the forest. I couldn't see plenty of trees, but, but I couldn't see the, the shape of the, of, of, the, of the thing at all. So many writers that I've talked with have grown up with at least one parent that uh, suffers from a mental illness or a parent that's absent or a parent that is struggling with mm -hmm. alcoholism. Um, do you notice that as well among your writer friends, it, seems, it almost seems as if there's material, rich material derived from, from that situation that helps writers, or <clears throat> writers are trying to figure it out maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I, would, I would go so far as to say it's not just writers. I think it's, I think it's artists in creative general. Types. That is, yeah, Thank creative, you. creative Thank types. Artists, artists with a capital A, yes. whether you're a photographer, right. filmmaker, painter, right. um, um, photographer, whatever, whatever that is. I think we're, I think we're prone uh, to, that, to that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was. There was a historian, famous historian, who used to who used to talk about nations and nation states, and saying that that um, in order in order to have a great nation or a great civilization, um, you have to have you have to have two things in a, in a kind of balance. On the one hand, you have to have resources. Um, as a nation, you can't go anywhere if you don't have the raw materials with which to with which to build a, a nation or a nation state. But on the other hand, too, you have to have a challenge. Um, and if you have either an abundance of resource and no challenge, or you have a series of enormous challenges and no resources with which to, to meet those challenges, then, then, you, then you have no chance really to have a great nation or a great, or, or a great civilization. Nothing, nothing to, to work overcome. For, nothing to fight for. And he was, that historian was talking about nations, but I think it's also a, a lovely paradigm for, for individuals too, because we see all the time in this life people with no resources, who seem just, you know, so, so far behind that it's hard to imagine how they would ever, how they would ever catch up. And then you see, you see, frankly, too, <laughs> you see all kinds of people who live the kind of privileged lives of astonishing privilege that, that just diminishes their, their moral scope. 
Um, and so that kind of having an, an enormous research resources without anything, anything really to focus, to focus the energy or to, uh, upon which to build a moral vision, um, can, can, um, uh, can result can result in a in a person who's who seems often just to be going through the motions, wandering. Yeah, wandering, wandering and, without yeah. a purpose. Yeah. So um, ultimately, was was the writing of this memoir cathartic for you? Exhausting? Both? Um, what what? You, I think you're probably still processing it. But what do you think that you gleaned or gained from turning your attentions to writing a memoir? Well, I got an answer to some of the questions that I was posing for myself. So in that, there's, there's a way that I understand now um, my mother's life better than I did before. Um, I understand the deep bond that we had, that, that our own lives, how, how, since we both grew up in Gloversville, how our own lives were, sh were shaped and haunted. Um, I understand that for her, there were always this town was always two towns, the town that she loved as soon as she escaped it, uh, and, and, and the place that was her prison whenever she was there. She gave that to me in a slightly different form, because for me there are also two Gloversvilles. There's the, there's the one that, that, um, um, that I'm free to love because I keep reinventing it in these novels that I write, but one that I have a very difficult time actually physically returning home to because that's my mother's Gloversville, and her um, her sense of it as a as a place where you die, where you where, where, where that you can't escape, that will cage you, was the first really powerful um, opinion I think I ever got in this life, and and one that because it came to me so young, um, is is very is very difficult for me to shake. But to return to your original question, whether it was cathartic, and, and I wouldn't say that at this point, I'd love to say, God, I'm so glad I did this. I feel so much better. I got this off my chest. That would be, I think, um, um, a lie. So I'm not going to say that to you. Um, but as with my novels, what I often find is that when I finish a book, it is, for me, nothing more than a collection of all of the problems within that book that I never found a solution for. When it really, the closing, you said it's, uh, yeah, I'm still in the process. The closing of the loop occurs. When I'm on the road someplace, when I'm in Boise, or, or when, I'm, when, I, when I'm somewhere, um, and someone says, after reading a novel of mine, comes up to me and says, you know, um, I put down your book last night, and I called my father. I hadn't talked to him in 25 years. That, for me, because what writers often don't see, they don't see, the, they don't see their books land. You know, it's a, you write them in a, in a kind of intense privacy, um, and they go out into the world, um, and unless you run into somebody reading a book of yours on a plane or something like that, you really don't, you really don't get a chance to, to, see, the, to, see, to see its effects. Except when you get out in the world, and every now and then somebody will come up to you and say, you know, your, your last novel got me through a round of chemotherapy. Thank you. And you think, whoa, whoa. And that's, and that's when you think, okay, I'm glad I, I'm glad I wrote that book. That, that, did, that did something for somebody. We're unfortunately rapidly running out of time, but I do want to ask you on this same theme um, that you contributed, you edited a, a small book that I recommend uh, that people read called A Healing Touch which is about end-of-life care and hospice mm -hmm. care. And you wrote it even before you wrote your memoir about your mother. Yeah. There's a, you have a beautiful essay in there about uh, a person that you know uh, taking care of his wife with early-onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Why was that so important to you? It was, a, it was a fundraiser for the local hospice. But just briefly, why was it important for you to contribute to edit this book about end-of-life issues? Well, the, the, the person um, uh, that I wrote that essay about, um, um, a, a wonderful man named, named Lee Duff, um, was a friend of mine. We had been friends for years. And I, and I knew, um, we used to play racquetball together, and I could, and I could see um, when we were on the court, there were some days that he was not there. And I knew that his wife was ill. Um, Lee was very private. He didn't, um, until things got really bad, he didn't, he didn't say an awful lot to me about what was troubling him. But I knew he was, I knew he was in rough uh, emotional shape. And, um, 
he 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 came to me one day um, after after his wife had finally died, and um, uh, and and it was it was it was horrible what he went through. Um, but he came to me and said, you know, I'm um, uh, I'm on the board of this hospice, and 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 he said. My God, we're poor. Um, could you can you think of anything that can you think of anything that we could do uh, if you give a reading or something like that? But it just seemed like so little money would come of that. So we batted it around and just decided to do the, to do this book. But it was really a, different uh, authors contributed. Yeah, As I said, yeah, I recommend yeah. people read this. Going back to the memoir, one thing I noticed strongly was that the themes that you and your mother dealt with in life, these paradoxes of being tied to a town but wanting to flee it, mm -hmm. uh, you. They're in your books as well. Yes. I mean, there's just, there's, this is a big theme of these contradictions in life, as I mentioned in my introduction. Yeah. You know, the, the, the intersections between things that maybe don't make sense. Yeah. Well, that's the crucible of fiction, isn't it? I think is is um, those those paradoxes, those conflicts in in life. Those are the things that that just um, they 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 drive our lives. They drive us towards the the destinies that that continue to puzzle us more and more. The older the older that that we get, uh, but conflict is the stuff of is the stuff of fiction. It doesn't come from fiction. Doesn't come from things that we know. It comes from things that we don't know, and we're 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 struggling to find out. It's why why Dickens, you know, after novel after novel after novel, why his why his why his books are full of orphans because, at some crucial point in his at some crucial point in his life, he felt orphaned, and um, so yeah, these but but this this all of these characters, so many of these characters in in, in my books are are running away from something at almost the exact same speed that 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 <laughs> that it's moving and the, whether they're chasing it or running away from it and sometimes when it catches them they turn around and chase it it's it's just um it's just seems to me that it seems to me to be the way we are and looking back at our lives the what ifs in our lives oh god you know, yes just, the what ifs the what ifs <laughs> what if i had stayed in gloversville you yeah. know uh, things like that. What if I hadn't married this person? What if I? Well, what if I hadn't married this person? Um, that's one of the great what what ifs in 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 my life. I, I I mean I've Lord knows I've made I've made my share of mistakes. But one of the things that I did right was marry the right woman. Uh, I, I I was clever enough to marry up and and to marry a a, a, um, a marvelous and and heroically understanding uh, uh, human being. Many of your books have uh, male protagonists, mm -hmm. strong male characters. Do you think that you have more male readers than female, or do you know? Oh, I have many more female readers. Interesting. Many more. Interesting. Well, I think three quarters. Maybe because more women read. I, mean, I, well, yeah, I was just you, <laughs> you. You couldn't wait for me to get that yeah. out, could you? <laughs> no, I mean three quarters at least of the serious fiction readers uh, okay. in the United States are are women. I think as my as my own career as a writer has has uh, the arc of my career uh, has been that my early books seem to be about male male misbehavior. Um, at some point along the way, I looked around as a just as a as a writer looked around and saw that at that time I was uh, um, I was I was married. I had two wonderful daughters. My mother was still alive then. I just looked around at all of them. All of the important people in my life were were women, and my and and my books from Empire Falls on began to began to really ref, reflect that reflect that reality. But um, you know, even the early stuff, I, I found that um, for reasons that I couldn't figure out at first, my books were being taught in in women's studies course, and I always I always wondered what so that to prove that look they're 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 just like we thought they were or, or <laughs> well some of the some some people have criticized your female characters as yeah, being yes, either yeah, yeah. angels or yeah yeah devils yeah, you know, not yeah. having much but that's a whole <laughs> other discussion um, real real briefly cuz we're running out of time but I I want to ask you this uh, you, you have the privilege to write movies right Mm -hmm. television programs and movies that are adapted from mm -hmm. your books, that you adapt from your books. And I've watched several of them, and they're, they're quite different in some ways from the books. They have to be because you have to collapse time from a 500-page yeah, yeah, book to yeah. probably about a 110-page yeah. script. Yeah. Um, frustrating, loads of fun, both. Uh, you, you're able to add some things in, actually, mm -hmm. that you, you weren't able to in the books, which mm -hmm. is kind of neat. Yeah. Well, I kind of divide my time now, back and forth. I'm working on right now a, a, a script with my friend Robert Benton, and um, we've done several movies together. And I did several movies, as you know, with Paul Newman. 
Um, writing screenplays came along at a perfect point yeah. in my life. I was looking to collaborate. And um, writing novels is a very lonely business. You're responsible for everything. And um, working on a screenplay, one of the things you become very clear about very early <laughs> is that you're important for a short period of time. And when, and when that time elapses, you will know it. <laughs> it it will move on and you will stay right where you <laughs> right right where you were before the phone rang the first time but you've been able to successfully adapt your your films mm. um and like as i said even tweak your your books a little bit it's you so know it's that, interesting you get to uh, you, you, with a novel you make your decisions and um once you walk through Every time you have a choice of how the narrative is going to move and proceed, every time, you, every time you make a choice, you've got a bunch of doors, and every time you make a choice, you walk through one of those doors, that door closes behind you. Um, when you write a film based on, your, um, uh, based on a novel of yours, you get to kind of revisit some of yeah. those decisions um, because, as you say, everything does have to, have to collapse. Um, and so what worked in the book may not work in the movie. You may have to find another solution to uh, the same or different problems. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different solution to the, you, to the same Rubik's Cube. You get to work with live actors like uh, Paul Newman. and yeah. Minip Oh, my God. Yeah. Hearing, hearing an actor, that's one of the great things about, for, for me about writing film, is that sometimes you'll hear an actor read one of your lines. Sometimes you'll think, oh, that's not the way it's supposed to go. But other times, a great actor like Ed Harris um, or Joanne Woodward uh, or, or Paul Newman will, will, will read a line that you've written and there's something in it that you didn't know was there. It's amazing, and how, isn't it? And how, and how great is that? Because, you know, you like to think that you are in charge of all of your nuances, but, but a great actor will find something from his life, her life, her experience, and, and suddenly there it is and you think, oh, God, I'm even smarter than I thought. <laughs> and another screenplay in your future? Uh, I, I certainly hope so. I, I, I enjoy doing it. Um, um, unfortunately, I think there probably will be more television in my future than, than movies because I think we're right, we're right in the middle of the golden age of television right now, and we're certainly not in the middle of the golden age of movies. The kinds of movies that I'm interested in, in, in writing um, um, are, there, there are not that many of them being made, and the ones that are, you have difficulty getting financed, but there's a lot of great television out there. And a sequel to? And I'm working Nobody's on a Fool. sequel to Nobody's Fool, too, so I'm a couple hundred pages into it. Everybody's Fool. <laughs> it's going to be called Everybody's Fool. That's, that's right. <laughs> well, come back and visit us again. I, I am really enjoying Boise. It's, it's um, I will be back. All right, great. Well, you have been listening to author Richard Russo. He was in Boise to speak to the Idaho Humanities Council. And my thanks to that organization for sharing him with us. And of course, to you too, Mr. Russo, thank you. For more information on him or to listen to this interview again, check out the Dialogue website at idahoptv.org. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Pres presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.